I'm Aaron here with AppGeo, and you are here for the Harvest Habitat and Conservation webinar, where we're going to be talking about automating habitat game and inventory programs. Um, and this presentation is being made on April 22nd, 2021, and will be available as a recording um, in our library afterwards. Just a little more information on that webinar library. You can find it on our website, appgeo.com slash webinars. You'll find recordings of all the webinars we've done over the past couple of years, uh, some really great topics. And if you find today's presentation interesting, I guarantee there is some other uh, recordings in there that you will find a lot of value in. So head on over there and you can also free register for some of our upcoming events as well. So just a quick background on AppGeo and the organization putting on this show for you today. Um, for those of you who are not so familiar with us yet, please allow me to offer this very brief introduction. You know, we're a geospatial IT firm. Um, we've been around for 30 years now and we're based in Boston, but we have folks all over the country as you'll learn today. And, you know, we do all things geospatial, whether it be a project with data, application development, uh, systems integration, cloud transformation, you know, the list goes on and on. And, you know, the big takeaway I want you to know about us is we're all about helping you do more with your data, getting more value out of your data and delivering that value to your organization and its stakeholders. So we're friendly people to work with, and I hope that comes through in today's presentation. Um, taking a look at our audience today, just before we go through our agenda, um, we truly have a great audience, uh, great representation from coast to coast and plenty of Canadians as well. So if you recognize my last name is uh, Canadian. So <laughs> I am glad to see you all here. Um, so to talk about our agenda, I'm going to be walking through uh, some of the introductions and background, um, a very a really high level overview of programs in both Texas and Nevada. From there, our experts are going to be discussing a little bit more uh, in detail about how all this works and um, some of the new features that we have come up with. Um, and from there, you know, summarizing the, the programs and then taking it to discussion, you know, talking about what's on your mind. Um, you know, you're going to be hearing today about some of the financial incentives and how, you know, these new features are allowing, you know, more user engagement, more self-service, if you will. So um, we have put together what I like to consider an all-star cast for today's presentation, um, and I'll offer up some quick introductions before we get started. Um, so myself, I'm our webinar program lead here at AppGeo, among other things, um, and I wanted to share a little bit about how we each connect to the outdoors. After all, it is Earth Day, so thank you for coming and celebrating with us. But, um, you know, over the past several months, I've, I've gotten into wildlife photography, and I've always loved hiking and being outdoors. We are also joined today by Eric. He is a senior consultant here at AppGeo, um, and he's based in Carson City. He is an expert on the Endow project that we're going to be talking about. Um, and of course, he hates mountains and trail work and all the volunteering that he does um, with the United States Forest Service. But, you know, does that look like the face of someone who's having a bad time? I don't think so. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, we have Jackie with us. She is a incredible project manager here at AppGeo. And perhaps even more importantly, she's an Austin local. And she's been spending uh, her COVID time uh, getting the green thumb learning about gardening and uh, growing her own vegetables and uh, somewhat of a biologist herself. So <laughs> um, I'm happy to be joined by these panelists and let's dive in. Oh, and I would actually like to mention really quickly, we uh, would have had um, Caitlin from our team on today, um, who is, who's put a lot of work into this as well. But unfortunately, uh, she was feeling ill. So um, we're missing her. But thank you, Caitlin, for all the work that you've done on this project. Um, so looking at Texas to start. Um, I just want to drive a couple points home here. The first being that this is a $2 billion per year industry, um, the white tailed deer hunting economy in Texas. Um, so, you know, if you put that on the fortune 500, you'd be up there, right? Uh, it is a big deal and it affects a lot of people. The other thing to keep in mind is that Texas is interesting and in that it's 90% of the land area there is privately owned. And therefore, 
for the state to be successful in a program uh, like the one you're going to hear about today, the cooperation with these private landowners uh, is going to be critical for managing that herd. So what were the goals of this project? What are the overreaching things it's trying to achieve? Well, Number one is, you know, maintaining these quality habitats. A quality habitat is a quality herd. You know, if we mismanage our ecosystems, this parable has been given time and time again, we lose out on that and, and things can collapse pretty quickly as has happened in, in different parts of the country. So how do we achieve that? Um, well, we've been developing this location specific methodology where we use our tools in GIS, we use our geospatial uh, knowledge and data um, to provide some real interesting incentives for, uh, you know, location targeted harvesting, whether it be extending the season in certain places and ad uh, offering additional tags. Um, you know, there is a give and a take with everything, right? And if we can offer the right incentives in the right places, we can achieve greater success. And then perhaps even more importantly is that efficiency piece, allowing landowners to participate that, you know, in this fully online process. So you're not waiting in line um, down like at the DMV, <laughs> um, you know, some of those have started to go online. I think people like it a lot more than, um, doing everything in person and manually. So just a little bit more about the program before I dive in, um, as you can see this, some of the history here, this, uh, you know, hunting in Texas has been going on since before they were a, a state. And, uh, this is some of the data that we have, um, on the project and the program where, um, for years, it was growing and growing and growing. Um, but now we are, you know, starting to level off as we get toward 2017. And that is largely in part due to the limitations of the resources that they had. They had so many people on staff and more and more permits coming in. And they don't have the time to approve more. Um, so, you know, it's, the program had run up against that natural capacity, a, a bottleneck, if you will. Um, just looking at some of the information that is being captured and understood here, you know, the different land tracks in uh, Texas, some of the ecological uh, layers, all of the different land classifications and satellite data and land cover data that goes into this. Um, plenty of, of course, biological concerns and constraints and counts. Um, all of this is being managed and this is what they were going to get into in a little bit here, but um, you can see there's quite a lot of data that has to be managed and understood for every single square mile in the entire state. That's a pretty big undertaking. So um, finally here, once this program was implemented, you can see that leveling off. Now we're continuing to grow again um, because of that automation that is in place and is allowing you know more work to be done with less uh, time and energy. And the interesting takeaways that we've seen, um, the program popularity here in, in Texas is increasing. Well, in other states, they have actually been seeing a decrease, uh, you know, as demographics and hunting popularity is fluxed over time. Um, and what's even more impressive is that they've been able to do this while keeping their staff, um, you know, their headcount relatively constant for the past 20 years. They've been able to grow. Um, and that recent growth is in large part, we believe, due to the automation that we've put in place. And then uh, finally, a couple of thoughts that, you know, the pandemic uh, and all this come out of it, it, we've actually observed that it's created new hunters, you know, maybe a new generation and interest as all outdoor activities are kind of on the rise. So we can kind of expect the ripple from this to continue uh, for years to come. And again, the real win here is a more sustainable habitat overall. And you're going to learn about how that was possible. So last I'll say on the matter before I turn it over to our, our real experts, as we go deeper into both of these programs, I want you to consider how the lessons we examine today might apply to your state or organization. You know, again, the key theme for today is about using the technology that's now available to speed up some of those processes, which in the past, they could take a long time, a lot of redundant steps. And this, of course, leverages 
everyone in an organization to do what they do best. You know, we just had a really cool conversation um, in our last webinar with Frank Winters. He's the current NISJIC president and New York State GIO. And he was really reiterating this concept of freeing up people to work on what they, you know, contribute what they do best, what they specialize in. And if everyone in every organization takes that mindset as a society and as a group, we all achieve more. So again, we all want to make that difference. We all want to have a meaningful impact. And how we do that is freeing up staff to work on those complex situations, the the stuff that they're really exercising their brain and their degree um, and incredible talents. So in, in not, not just filling out paperwork. So think about that. And I'm going to turn it over to Jackie to uh, go a little deeper into the Texas program. So take the stage, Jackie. Thanks, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm Jackie Davis. I'm the project manager for the Texas Parks and Wildlife application for about two years now. Um, and I'm going to talk about some specifics about how the Texas Parks and Wildlife land management assistance application works um, and highlight some of the new features and services that we've been working on. Um, I think, as you guys know, hunting is pretty important in Texas. Um, it's important to preserving the Texas heritage. Um, it's important in terms of conservation. Um, and it's a huge economy, as Aaron said, about $2 billion a year. Um, just a quick note to everyone before I get started, there are going to be a few acronyms that I'm going to be using. Um, so TPWD is for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Um, LMA is going to be the land management assistance application, which is the main application um, that we're going to be that I'm going to be talking about here. And then the third acronym is MLDP, which is the managed lands deer program, which is what private landowners are going to be using to participate um, into it, sorry, there's a jet flying and that's never happened before. <laughs> Hopefully you guys can't hear it. Um, but MLDP is the Managed Lands Deer Program, which is uh, how the private landowners are going to be participating in the LMA application um, so that they can get the extra tags and the longer seasons. Aaron, so if you move to the next slide, yeah, keep clicking. Um, yeah, so as we mentioned before, this application was built to foster and support sound management and stewardship of native wildlife habitats, um, and deer hunting is an important part of that. And I think starting from the beginning, um, this application was designed over the course of multiple on-site, off-site, and online interviews and sessions with the folks at Texas Parks and Wildlife. And when we first started, you know, we thought that we had a single set of business rules that are listed here. But as we continued, we realized that these business rules just kept expanding and expanding. Um, if you click a couple more times, Aaron, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so everything got pretty complicated pretty quickly. And now we have, I think, about 300 business rules that were previously um, all just in the biologist's head or figured out through various Excel spreadsheets. Um, and I want you to think about how your organization is run. And I'm sure you guys have business rules, reports, user roles, um, reporting deadlines, eligibility requirements that is all out there. But how can you make sure that everybody is sticking to this um, every single time and in the same way. So we have all these rules and our challenge was to make this pretty complicated process uh, an easy to use interface for the biologists who were extremely burdened um, and easy to sign up for a process for the private landowners so that they could get the benefit of this program, as well as the other user roles in here, such as administrators, law enforcement, um, and anyone else who touches this program. And we wanted to transform this painful process into something that was easy and simple to use for Texas Park of the Wildlife. Um, yeah, so... Here we have the old workflow 
um, for signing up for your property. The old way, you know, prior to the system that we helped build and even prior to the initial system that we took over for, um, the old way was through snail mail. Someone would come out to your property, uh, you would have to mail in your request, you would then have to send in the money and then you would get the tag by mail. And this would all take a few weeks before you were able to get your harvest recommendation or before you were able to enroll in the conservation program. Um, and so this was pretty uh, burdensome uh, when early on in the program when TPWD had, you know, like 3 million acres and, uh, maybe 300 sites in the early 2000s, but now they have, I think over 28 million acres registered in the program over close to 20,000 sites. Um, and throughout this whole time, they haven't been able to increase their staff numbers to accommodate this. And that caused a lot of workload struggles. Um, so if we move to the next slide, the new workflow um, is, where a landowner comes in, they can register online. The application is able to calculate the number of deer tags that can be assigned to that property. And the application generates the deer tags for the landowner to print at home so that they can be on their way. And so if we move to the next slide, you can see this being demoed in about a 60 second animation, um, super quick. Uh, so this is from the landowner perspective, the entire process to register your property in the system has gone from weeks to minutes. Um, and the barrier for entry to like getting your property in the system has now significantly reduced, um, which I think is pretty awesome. And so as you can see here, you can use um, either satellite or a default map imagery to draw and upload your property boundaries. The system is able to check um, whether your property is overlapping with other properties as well. Um, and you are taken through uh, what is essentially that giant list of business rules that I showed earlier um, and distilling them down into this logic pathway that has um, some pretty simple UI saying, okay, if you said yes to this, go this way. If you said no to this, go this way to register your property. Um, and once you've done all that, you get like a really nice little pop-up saying you did it, congrats. Do you wish to be contacted by a biologist? Um, and that is a key piece of functionality here um, because not only does it increase the biologist's efficacy because they can only reach out to people who are requesting to be reached out to. Um, it also gives the property owner some more autonomy and therefore a better chance that they're gonna remain in the program. And then what you're seeing here is that once your property is in the system, you can enroll in one of the programs that the Texas Parks and Wildlife um, MLDP program offers. Um, here we're seeing that the property uh, can be registered into the harvest option. Um, the system will automatically calculate uh, the total amount of tags that the property can have um, and then be able to print out the tags from the comfort of the landowner's home. And, you know, a few weeks of processing is now essentially done in about two minutes. Um, all the Excel calculations that biologists previously had to manually run are queried in the back end, and um, all the checks are done within seconds. And the same process is applied to this idea of the conservation option enrollment, which um, has slightly different business rule than the harvest option enrollment because it requires that you work with um, a biologist, whereas the harvest option is more kind of do it yourself. And so what we're showing now is um, the biologist view, um, the main workflow for a biologist. Um, so we have automated a bunch of stuff in the system. Um, so much so that last year we were able to add new species to the program for participants to register for. Um, but 
all of these properties and recommendations, they need a biologist to approve and confirm that the recommendations that are auto-calculated by the system are um, what the biologist agrees on. So previously a biologist had to, you know, submit all of this manually, uh, which was a lot of administrative time on the biologist part, um, but now they're able to log into the site, see exactly which properties need their attention, um, which properties need to have recommendations reviewed for, um, and they're able to see a system calculated number of permits to make a recommendation against. Um, and the biologist can say, yes, I agree with this based off of the property boundary or no, I don't. And I think they should have more tags or less tags. And I know this doesn't seem like an insane enhancement, but it is one of the biggest time-saving factors for biologists, supervisors and, and administrators in the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Um, so with the same number, oh, if you go back a little bit, Aaron. Yeah, so with the same number of staff, Texas Parks and Wildlife has been able to expand the types of recommendations they provide. Um, they have been able to increase the number of properties assigned per biologist with, to, uh, even though they have the same number of staff um, over the past 20 years. But um, there is only so much you can automate before you reach a critical mass. Um, and adding all of these enhancements that you've seen up till now delayed the need for Texas Parks and Wildlife to add on to their staff for, you know, at least four or five years um, because their existing staff were able to function so much more efficiently because of the automation in the system or in large part due to the system that we helped create. But um, looking at the reporting metrics year over year, I think it became really clear to the folks at the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department that in order to keep supporting the program to the level that their users expect, they needed to add more staff. So as of this month, uh, like April 5th, Texas Parks and Wildlife rolled out the newest site functionality, which Aaron, if you can go on, which is the ability to actually charge a license fee for access to the tags. Um, so right now you guys are viewing the new shopping cart page from, I think it's a landowner perspective. Um, the shopping cart page kind of auto-populates auto based on whatever program the user is enrolled in. Right here you can see that um, the AppGeo testing site is enrolled in the conservation option enrollment. Um, and from this site, uh, the user jumps to the official texas.gov website, which takes the credit card information and the payment. Um, and whether that payment is registered as a failure or a success that is sent back into the LMA system um, so that users are able to either print tags if the payment was a success or not print tags if the payment was a failure. And so as I keep mentioning, you know, this program is all about longevity, um, conserving Texas wildlife for the years to come, which feels pretty appropriate being that it's Earth Day. Um, and that conservation mindset is intricately tied with the hunting practices here in Texas. Um, and in order for the Parks and Wildlife team to support this program, this licensing fee is essential for them to maintain the quality of work that Texas Parks and Wildlife has been able to provide to date. Um, and so by having participants pay for the benefit that the tags give them, which is um, liberalized hunting seasons and property specific bag limits, TPWD is not only able to get in on this, you know, $2 billion hunting industry that's out there, but they're also able to support it because they're the ones helping to conserve massive amounts of um, habitat in the process. So yeah, if we go to the next slide, what has implementing the license fee done, given that we haven't even had a full month of it. But in the first day, uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife was able to process over 600 transactions. And I think it's up to 
like uh, over a thousand transactions now, which has been a fantastic test of our system. Um, and it's a pretty great metric to uh, talk about the popularity of the program, right? It's still very early on before hunting season even starts. And we already have over a thousand transactions recorded, paid for, people are ready. Um, and in the same week, with our automated processes, we were able to kick off this re-enrollment process that includes 95% um, of the standalone properties in the, in the program, which is, I think, close to 7,000 properties, um, which, you know, having them re-enroll automatically guarantees a continuation of the program um, because it eliminates the issue of potential attrition by clerical admin, like lazy user error that would normally come with a, with a manual system. Um, and this is just another way by which we are making sure that the program can last indefinitely and, and grow for the years to come. So if we move on, what we have implemented for Texas Parks and Wildlife um, has encouraged landowners to participate more in conservation practices, all of it to ensure that um, Texas can keep hunting for the foreseeable future, keep their hunting tradition alive for future generations, as well as um, ensuring that the Texas flora and fauna are thriving, right? In this first bullet here, that there is an increase in the number of places to hunt that actually reverses the trend that's happening across the country. Um, and up until you know, this month with no increase in staff, Texas was seeing a significant increase in their capacity to grow their program further. Um, and I would encourage you to think about how with your existing staff and potentially less administrative work, how could your programs benefit from automation? So if we move to the next slide. Yeah, um, I think what we've been seeing and what we've been hearing from both Parks and Wildlife and landowners and the various other users is that this new application is so much faster and easier for people to use, reducing that um, barrier for entry for participation into the program or um, getting rid of some frustration that people might have had with the previous system or the, the previous method of you know snail mail. Um, and with this program, the hunting economy and the conservation that comes with it can continue to grow and prosper. And um, yeah, you know, looking ahead, uh, what is it that we can do to reach more customers, increase conservation and stewardship for landowners and managers? One of the one of the things that Parks and Wildlife has continuously <laughs> been throwing out there is expanding the the species that we monitor. Um, and track in this application. Uh, they talk about alligators a lot. Um, and <laughs> I'm still waiting to see that happen, but that is something that, that happens down here in Texas. And then moving forward, I think Texas is looking at doing a lot of project tracking, habitat project tracking, um, mapping by the habitat pra practices applied and by the project dollars applied um, in that in those areas. So, and that feeds in pretty nicely to how NDAO is using their system. Um, and then Parks and Wildlife is also talking about adding a census module for deer population tracking, which is only gonna help improve the conservation practices that they currently have implemented. So with all of that, I will let Eric take over to talk about how NDAO is using their system. Yeah, thank you so much, Jackie, for that rundown. And I just love the example of the, you know, 600 applications in a day, if you can imagine, you know, 600 envelopes showing up that you have to open and manually process, like just that image alone to me makes it seem worthwhile. And um, Eric, I'd love to welcome you on to um, talk about the work that you've been doing. Oh, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, 
here in Nevada, we don't have a lot of concern about alligator conservation, but that would be interesting since most alligators here seem to appear on the outside of cowboy boots that I see. Uh, so Nevada, the driest state in the nation, a little different from Texas, 85% uh, federal land instead of 95% private. So think of public lands with islands of private in the middle of it. And let me give you a little background on Nevada Department of Wildlife and, and what they do in this particular um, arena in which we are working with them. They conduct over 600 habitat conservation projects annually, and those are funded from multiple sources. Some of the characteristics of those projects are that they vary in size from creating, say, a single water source for wildlife that might be a tenth of an acre in size to reseeding and conservation stabilization of a 100,000 acre wildland fire burn. This could be a one day effort, almost a one person effort, or it could be a multi-year project or projects that are planned for a single year that become multi-year because of weather. So you're not gonna fly $25,000 worth of seed onto a landscape when it's been such a dry year that it will never grow. And of course, these are almost inherently multi-agency in nature given the public land nature of the state itself. So as a state agency, NDAO is almost always in collaboration with a federal agency. Um, and if not, then often in collaboration with private landowners, um, conservation organizations of different sorts and so on. One of the reasons why I mentioned that Nevada is a very arid state is that out here, uh, it's essentially a very fragile environment. So it's not just a matter of improving habitat and trying to increase wildlife populations. It's a matter of preventing destruction or mitigating destruction. And that destruction can be natural or man-made, either one. But in any case, that's all part of the Endow mission. And with all these projects and this kind of complicated mix of funding and organizations and actions that are required, boy, keeping track of those 600 projects is a, is a tough job. And you know that work, at a, as all of you are probably familiar with, includes both the pre-planning, where should we stage a project, then planning the project, budgeting it, getting it funded from a variety of sources, conducting the field work, which we all, which of course one naively tends to think of as, well, that's the real work, uh, and then monitoring and reporting upon those results. Next slide, please, Aaron. So why build an application? Well, I wanna tell you that Endow had, uh, had has a perfectly good Microsoft Access front end to an enterprise database for tracking these projects. Um, it doesn't track everything they want to know about them. But you know what? There's so little time for data entry or information management that it's hard for biologists to find the time to enter that information. It's like it's an extra step for them today. So today they have to go do all that work that I just described and then when they get a little quiet time, which is never, probably like all of you, then they can catch all that up in the database. So that doesn't happen very often. So another kind of barrier is that, of course, as Jackie mentioned as well, these things become increasingly complex over time, their scale increases, and their, the nature of the projects themselves has uh, become more complicated with increasingly uh, growing demands upon the public lands and the landscape as a whole. Not just public lands, but even private lands. Then lastly, there's a lack of complete spatial data that's um, really hampering interagency and multi-agency management of the entire landscape. As all of you have heard, and as really Jackie talked about in Texas, when we talk about conservation, we're talking about um, managing landscapes as a whole because species as a whole, particularly in rather food poor environments like the Great Basin, uh, tend to need large areas of land and large contiguous areas of land. And if you don't have spatial data that helps you understand what you've done, where you've done it, when you did it, 
what's happened to the landscape since then. Perhaps it burned, perhaps it didn't. Then you're really stuck for creative and forward-looking management. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. So these are all reasons to build an application. So let's talk about how we got into building this application. So the first thing was to spend a considerable amount of time working with the biologists at Endow to understand what's the, what's the kind of natural workflow that works for them. So how do we make information entry be part of the process rather than make it be the afterthought or the when I get free time, I'll do it part of the process. And this is what you just heard from Jackie as well, which is rather than it being this sort of um, clerical process, how do we make this information happen just once? Uh, collect the information as part of the work. So idealized somewhat here, the workflow in the application as a whole, which is an early beta right now, is that one goes in and you can do pre-planning with GIS analysis. Then once you've done your pre-planning, you can begin the project formation and application. That includes budget creation, um, identifying funding sources and proposed budgets, and so forth. Then as needed, that process can follow the agreed upon business rules pertaining to science review and funding approval. Some projects don't need any of that. They're already funded, simple work, the way it goes. But in any case, there's a review step that is part of the business rules, depending upon the nature of the project and the nature of the funding sources. So then the part that I said earlier, people tend to think of as the actual work, which is actually going out doing the field work. But you may propose to, for example, to do 2000 acres of some kind of vegetation management, but the practical reality in the field is you can only do 1650. Where did we lose that, that those acres, those 350 acres? We wanna know that. So the application actually allows one to go back in and to report not only on proposed treatment and proposed conservation actions, but on realized treatments and realized conservation actions. Then lastly then, as projects close out, there's a closeout process um, and that leads over to the public and stakeholder reporting. As I said earlier, most of these projects are multi-agency in nature and there are multiple interested parties, even if they are single agency in nature, who want to know for their management purposes, what has been done with public dollars to advance conservation. Why? Because they themselves are part of a conservation planning and action uh, process. So uh, the important thing, and I think you heard this from Jackie earlier, is that we're really letting biologists focus on the part that is what biologists do, not what clerks do, but what biologists are great at. And how, how does one do this, right? I said earlier, we're making the information be part of the whole project life cycle. It's not an afterthought. Information born digital, it's not digitized later. That alone is a huge time saver, as Jackie mentioned in the Texas case. Geospatial is part of that born digital world. It's not, again, not an afterthought, not a, geez, I hate GIS. Uh, I only use it twice a year. I have to start up whatever my desktop GIS is, and then I have to remember how to digitize a polygon, how to digitize a line, and then I have to remember to send it over to the GIS team so they can get it. And frankly, you know, one of the things we've heard not from Endow's biologists, but from people in other venues in GIS is, you know, it's almost like I'm supposed to go to a meeting, but the first thing I have to do is I have to build the engine to put in the car to go to the meeting. That's why I don't do GIS, just too hard. So build it into the process in simple and easy ways. So indeed, as you just saw in the Texas animation, what you saw there, I don't know if you noticed that was that Somebody could go in very quickly and digitize for themselves that shape of their land as they see it. That gets checked later, of course. Same idea works here, right? Let's not make this hard for people. Let's make it easy for people. Again, let's let them focus on using their scientific abilities to do their work. 
So lastly, then, you know, we all win. It's a virtuous cycle if we communicate conservation actions to the public, to our partners, and in fact, to our fellow staff member inside of wildlife agencies. And that communication needs to be easy. So that's kind of the aims and goals and a little bit of background on Endow's conservation uh, data system application. Back over to you, Aaron. All right, thank you so much, Eric, for the deep insights there. Um, and at this point, I want to open it up to you, our audience, to um, ask away any questions that relate to the things that you heard about or maybe things you're curious about in your own state or your own organization about not only um, the wildlife side, but just automating um, processes. And I see um, some of you are raising hands. Uh, feel free just to type out your question and we can um, read it aloud and then um, make sure you're satisfied with your answer before moving on. There is the uh, Q&A module there. Um, and I know Jordan is going to be monitoring for questions as they come in. Um, and I believe we have our first one. Yep. Um, um, who are the users of the Texas system? Yeah, so Texas is kind of unique in that um, it's mostly private land. So the main users are landowners and then, of course, the Texas Parks and Wildlife staff themselves. Um, so you have biologists, administrators, um, and then in some cases, you have properties that have decided to join into what we call a co-op, co a cooperative. So they might have like what we call a pool manager that's kind of managing all of all of the properties for one. So there's, there's quite a few user roles. And then there's also um, law enforcement that use the site and they have limited permissions, but one thing they can do is search tag numbers so that they can make sure that there, there's no um, illegal illegal hunting or illegal printing of, of fake tags going on. Excellent. Thank you, Jackie. Um, so we do have another question for you, Jackie, on that note, um, maybe not on that note. How do landholders that are not computer literate engage with the program? Yeah, so that's something that um, that's where the biologists come in. Like someone can call TPWD and do a lot of this over the phone. I think in this day and age, you're finding less that people have never engaged with a computer or are compu completely computer illiterate. They are able to register to some extent with the site um, or with the application. And then if necessary, there's phone numbers they can call. There's even emails they can send um, and then a biologist can can work with them directly or even just like an administrator or support staff. Um, TPWD has a support line that you can call that can also deal with more of these administrative type issues. Yeah, I think like the real takeaway message there is that we're just increasing the options that are out there and mm -hmm. in our current day, like everyone is doing everything on their phone, right? So the majority of people take that route and then those that need a different uh, sort of service, then there's more capacity for them out there, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. And we do have another question that has come in. And actually, we have many questions that have come in. Um, so I'm going to start with this one, though. Who are the users of the Nevada system? Is it being built for staff only? So it, it's initially rolled out to end out staff. Um, it is designed to open up to partners. Partners can include private sector individuals or organizations, as well as other agencies. There is a public um, dashboard part. I didn't kind of emphasize that in the little screenshots that you saw, one, two, three, four. But when the public comes to the um, initial page of the site without signing in, you can get a summary of conservation efforts, expenditures, uh, proposed projects, and even then um, see those on a map and link to those uh, ones that are considered kind of showpieces by Endow. Would you like to add, add to that, Jackie, or, or 
No, okay. I'm going to move on to the next one because we have a lot coming in. I have a lot in the panelist chat that have come in. So if you do ask them on the chat, it will only show up to panelists. If you want everybody to see the question, you can go over to Q&A. And um, I have, are the Nevada, Nevada and other data you work with collected, collect consumable, exportable to standard desktop GIS data formats, ArcMap, et cetera? Sure. Yeah, we're actually um, storing it in an enterprise geo database, um, which is not not ours. It is um, actually Endow's enterprise geo database, and uh, one can connect to that um, with desktop GIS once you have appropriate credentials. And of course, Endow can also export that information. Yeah, and that's the... <laughs> similar to how Texas Parks and Wildlife is run. That interoperability piece is really crucial. Just, we have different people, different systems, different software. If your data can work in all of them, that's just a huge advantage in not having to convert things uh, for each step of the way. Thank you, Aaron. And so the next question we have is, do landowners and law enforcement access the system the same way, or are there different systems in access? They access it the same way in that there's a main login page, uh, depending on your user role provided, uh, like given when you create an account that is going to determine the access that you have. So it's all the same kind of website login and you, you see what you are supposed to see. Excellent. Um, and I'll move on to the next question then. Um, how long does the habitat have to be maintained once improved? Um, so if this is related to Texas Parks and Wildlife, um, there are the two kind of program options you can opt into. There's the harvest option, which is more do it yourself. And then the conservation option, which is um, where you would have to work with a biologist. And then um, you would have to report certain types of deer data and certain types of habitat um, management practices each year. I believe it's at least two, but don't quote me on that. Um, each two, about two habitat management practices each year in order to participate and remain in the program. Thank you. And that may have been a follow-up to this question, which is actually, so this is a transferable tag program used to improve habitat on the land accepted into the program? So the tags are not transferable. The program itself allows for um, a longer hunting season for those that are in the program and for property specific tag um, recommendations rather than you know season tag recommendations. So hopefully that answers that question. So Jackie, this this is Eric. Um, does that mean then that if I'm a landowner in Texas and I'm enrolled in the program and I get say six tags, mm -hmm. I can those tags are specific to my property, but now I can choose whether to sell those to hunters to use them myself. Correct, exactly, so and that's how that two billion dollar industry kind of exists. You have some properties that could have up to three hundred or four hundred mm -hmm. tags. Um, additional tags from this program. And if they want to sell those for whatever number they wish to sell them for so that people can come on their land and hunt, uh, that's how they, they make their money. Yeah. So, so, so the win-win in, yeah. in, oh, sorry, the win-win in Texas then is that you, you, you have landowners who not only can make money off their property with their tags, but by, but part of the reason they can do that is because they're pra doing good conservation practices. Exactly. Yes. I say better be careful. You'll find Mo from our company out there. Uh, he's a big deer guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to clarify, transferable from person to person, but they are specific to the property to which they were assigned. I think just to yes. clear that up. Yes. Very cool. And I will expand on that note to another question that has come in. Um, how do you verify the tracks the public are digitizing to be accurate? Um, it says and ownership, but how do you verify the tracks the public are digitizing to be accurate? Yeah, so the system, it works with Cardo. And basically, if a property that someone is self-reporting overlaps with an existing property in the system, the item, the property is flagged and sent to TPWD, TPWD staff to review. So, <laughs> um, and 
in that way, it kind of saves a lot of time instead of having to review everybody's properties and everybody's boundaries and having to input it themselves. They can just see when there's an issue and address it. So don't be trying to sneak onto your neighbor's uh, land. Exactly, exactly. They don't like that. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and in the application, you're able to add documents. So if you need to kind of like proof of property boundaries, if necessary. So as you're, as you're entering information in the application too, Jackie, can't you change the background? You can see a satellite image, for example. Mm -hmm. and yeah. So you and I think this is your own property. Yeah. You can have the standard view, like how somebody would view, uh, you know, your Google maps directions, and then you can have the satellite view, um, which really helps when maybe you want to follow your fence line directly. Great. And I'll move on to the next question as well. And I, I love the way this is worded. Can you add multiple transactions to the shopping cart or is it a single transaction shopping cart? Not sure if this would be a requirement. Yeah, so um, you can add multiple items into your shopping cart. So if you have, um, if you're only trying to pay for one management unit or if you're trying to pay for uh, 30 of them, you can add all 30 and it'll, it'll generate as a single invoice and you can select which ones you want to be a single invoice and that is sent through to the texas.gov system and then it comes back so uh yeah we we have to be really careful about like items transactions and invoices but um it, we have the multi-select option if you're eligible thank you jackie uh, and we'll move on to the next question as well. Are the tags printed on a special paper to protect them from weather and wear or tear or regular paper? <laughs> I, I believe it's uh, just regular paper. Yeah. Um, you know, you're given a copy. So if something goes wrong with your paper um, and you end up having to talk to law enforcement, they can check your tag number, but I think it's just regular paper. If you want to get fancy, you can bust out one of those uh, laminators. The laminators. Yeah. Remember, you used to have those all the time. <laughs> yeah, but um, if I'm remembering this correctly, I think when you're processing a deer, you have to take it to a special facility, and that that's where you break out the piece of paper that they clip onto the deer and process. Thanks, Shaggy. And this is uh, the final question so far, but feel free to keep asking. Is your group hosting the data or does Texas host and manage this database uh, themselves? For Texas and I think for Endow as well, the data is owned by Texas Parks and Wildlife and Endow respectively, it is theirs. Um, we just help with the way in which they manage it. It's true for Endow too. It's running on um, equipment that they pay for it is theirs. Excellent. Well, thank you, panelists. And thank you to everybody who asked questions and stayed for the Q&A session.